Um, I'm Hannah Dallas. I'm the Southern Windsor County Forester. This is a presentation of the common tree pests in Vermont, both native and invasive. So just a quick introduction, what to expect. Um, I'm going to kind of go over some uh, damage, different ways to look at tree damage, um, overview some of the common pests, insect pests, and then talk about some other tree health issues um, that you might originally think were insect related but may not be. Um, then show you some resources and then take questions at the end. If you want to put those questions in the chat, like Joey said, um, we can get to those at the end. So goals for today. I want to introduce you to some common pests. Um, I can't memorize them all. It's unlikely that you will memorize them all. There are a lot of them out there, um, but we can start to key in on common ones and, um, you know, and then just spark your curiosity about your trees and your forests and what you might be seeing, give you some tools to investigate further and, and maybe find out what the pest is. And, um, you know, I'll talk about some control strategies and how you might come to like contextualize these control strategies. Some of these insects are native. And so sometimes the control, control strategy is to just let nature kind of run its course. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then I want to just end with a reminder that the idea overall is to keep our forest healthy and balanced. And sometimes that means they're part of a larger ecosystem and there are some native pests that you know are going to run their course. And then there's other invasive ones that we're um, you know, far more concerned about because they don't fit well into our forest ecosystem that we have. So those are goals. There's a bunch of them, but we'll get to them. So understanding and assessing damage. Common causes of tree problems, it can be insects and mites, it can be animals, it can be diseases, both biotic and abiotic. And then, um, you know, for the insects and mites and animals, and, oh, and diseases also, I guess all of them, um, we can always talk about whether these things are native or invasive and whether they, you know, have a place in our ecosystem or are coming in without um, you know, effective balances and natural control measures. So it's always something we want to think about when thinking about forest pests. We also are always thinking about the level of damage. This can be a pattern within and among trees in a forest setting. It could be multiple species. Um, it could just be a single tree species or just a single tree. And so understanding and being observant of these patterns can help us key in on how big of an issue it is and, and even what the issue might be. And then we also have different types of damage. So for each tree, we could have damaging agents um, that affect the foliage or the twigs, stems, the trunk or the roots. Um, and both hardwood and softwood trees are impacted differently from these different um, types of damage. So a hardwood, let me skip just ahead. So a hardwood tree, sorry guys, I have a fly buzzing around. Um, a hardwood tree, you know, it's going to withstand defoliation a lot better than a conifer will. So it, uh, you know, a healthy hardwood can take the hit a couple times um, in multiple years of being defoliated, especially if that um, defoliation is happening later in the season when it's really photosynthesized effectively for most of the year um, and it's just the tail end of the season it's not going to be impacted as much but conifers you know they they rely on needles a lot of them are on like a three-year cycle um, so those needles take a lot to grow and they are relying on maintaining those needles for you know at least a couple years before they're being replaced and so they can die, you know, from just one year of being defoliated. So we want to really 
understand the different ways trees are impacted and whether the issue is something to be worried about or, or maybe not. So a few common pests. Um, so the next few slides are, you know, mostly caterpillars. So we're going to talk about this. This is forest tent caterpillar. You'll notice um, next to the name at the top of each slide, I've put whether it's N for native or I for invasive. Um, and so that, if you're looking for that information, that's, you know, right there at the top. So this is a native pest. Um, sugar maple is its primary target species. It has, you know, boom and bust infestation cycles. Um, because it impacts sugar maple, sugar bushes and, you know, sugar, the sugaring industry can be severely impacted from defoliation. The trees won't, um, will be a lot more stressed and won't produce as much sugar each year that they're defoliated. And so sometimes aerial sprays are used to control this pest, but because it's native, um, the this, this state of Vermont really emphasizes not using a control unless it's really necessary. Um, and so one of the things that you can do to buffer the effects of this pest is to diversify your sugar maple stand. Um, adding in diversity is the answer to almost any um, pest control. The more diversity you have, the less likely you are to have a forest that's really um, impacted by one of these pests because most of them are, you know, species specific. And um, they, so they can buffer the, the impact a little bit better. So um, before I proceed to the next slide, you'll also see that we're now just coming off of a big um, boom in forest tent caterpillar. So 2016 was the last peak um, and it moves throughout the state. And so we'll see infestation levels high in some areas and low in others throughout the state every year. Um, so, you know, like I said, adding some diversity into your stand. If you have um, like the hillside behind this red barn, you might have a pure sugar maple stand and that's going to be impacted a lot more than if you had, you know, think about if that stand had 25% non-sugar maple species in it, you would have canopy cover of 25% um, that, that was un, unaffected by this pest. So another um, caterpillar here is the, um, what was formerly known as the gypsy moth. It's now being referred to as LDD. Um, they're working on a name change right now. So this is an invasive. It was introduced from Europe. Um, but quite a while ago, it's been around for a while and it's uh, managed, it has some biocontrols. Um, oops, sorry guys, there we go. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, so it's managed with some, some fungal biocontrols and um, viral wet springs will help control the outbreak because funguses and viruses spread well when things are wet. Um, just a second here. Um, and so the, I get these easily confused with the caterpillars that we're looking at here. But if you go online, if you're wondering and you can get a picture of your caterpillar, um, it's pretty easy to go and compare. They have a lot of um, Google has a lot of side-by-sides of these caterpillars. So you can see from the previous slide, this um, forest tent has a lot more blue on it and it has these white dots down the back. And gypsy moth has these red and blue spots. Um, but the easiest way I find is to just, you know, do a quick Google search of forest tent and gypsy moth side-by-side. -side. Another one that um, can easily be confused and thrown into the mix is Eastern tent caterpillar. Um, this affects mostly just fruit and cherry trees. They um, make their nests in the crotches of trees. 
and these trees usually survive defoliation. They're not severely impacted. Um, and again, the, the caterpillar looks very similar. So it's, um, you know, just quick Google, Google search of a comparison if you're looking at um, a, a caterpillar on a tree in your yard or something like that. Um, these tents can also be um, broken open. If you just kind of take a stick and open them up for birds, they'll get in there and they love the, the uh, caterpillars and will happily, you know, open these up and, and eat them. They can also be, you know, um, fruit, um, orchard, sorry, orchards. Uh, we'll also spray for these with, again, with that BT spray to target the caterpillars if they're being um, severely impacted. Saddled prominent is another um, caterpillar. It's a native caterpillar and it prefers to feed on American beech, sugar maple, and um, you know, in high enough populations, it will feed on other things. This one, um, they're pretty large caterpillars when they when they really start to go through leaves. And you'll look up in the middle of the summer and the canopies will be pretty thin. Um, and this you can identify if you are kind of quiet and you listen, you'll hear the raining frass, um, which is a little gross, but a good identifier of these. And control for this, you know, it's it's going to have a boom and bust cycle. And, you know, one year the, there will be a lot of caterpillars. So um, birds and other, other small creatures that eat these will, their populations will expand. And then the next year um, they will suppress the expansion of these caterpillars. Maple leaf cutter is a native. This one has been um, pretty bad this year in, in the Southern Vermont um, area. This caterpillar is native. Um, they cut little um, discs out of the leaves and they kind of seal them together over themselves as a caterpillar to overwinter on the forest floor. Um, it, they make like a little, little home out of two leaf discs. Um, this, the holes that they create in the leaves, it's not um, too impactful on, on the tree's health, but it does, you know, create some early leaf drop and pull poor, sorry, poor foliage covers, colors, I'm sorry. Let me take a sip of tea. And so this one is concerning to, um, to landowners that see this in their trees and they're hoping for those fall colors, but you know, generally we're, we're not doing anything to control this other than just keeping our forest healthy um, and knowing that this will kind of pass through, through the area. It will have a, a natural boom and bust cycle. This is a um, aerial view of some forest um, leaf, maple leaf cutter. Um, you know, and it, it does have an impact, but it's mostly in the fall. You can see other trees are, it's, you know, towards the fall and, and everything is starting to senesce. These just really start to decline quickly in the fall. Fall webworm is another that we saw a bit of this fall. Um, it's feeding at the tips of the branches rather than the crotches of the branches. And it's, feeding in, in late summer, early fall, which really has very little effect on the tree's health. It's unsightly, um, you know, people get concerned about it because it's pretty obvious, like you can see it when you drive down the highway on a lot of trees. But again, it has little effect on the tree growth. There are a couple birch defoliators, birch leaf miner, which is an insect that is mining between the leaves of these birch trees. And then there's also birch skeletonizer, which is eating out um, the, you know, kind of the cells and the photosynthesis of a leaf, um, which you can see here on the right. So both of these, when you look up at a birch tree, it will be pretty difficult to tell which one it is, but if you can find the leaf on the forest floor, 
um, you can take a look. Yard trees are sometimes uh, sprayed again with BT, which is a um, targets caterpillars. That's why it's used so much for these caterpillar species. Um, but you know, in a forest, we're we're not really going to do much. That's why diversity and and promoting um, lots of different species in your forest and lots of different age classes of species really helps to buffer any of these effects and you're not losing an entire stand of trees at once. And then pear thrips, um, which is an invasive. Um, it attacks the buds of trees, mostly sugar maples. Um, and so when the leaves uncurl, Un, you know, un, open up in the fall, they're going to be stunted and curled and often have, um, you know, signs of damage. They, um, the damage increases when the weather is cool during the bud break. Um, so if we have kind of a slow spring, um, and then it can also um, be due to the, the, you know, development the following years. Um, what you can do for, for management for this is avoid, if you notice the foliation, and this is true for any of these, um, but especially for pear thrips, if you notice defoliation, try not to do any more um, sand disturbance in that year or, you know, couple years following can help the trees recover. And so um, that can mean postponing forest management activities if they're scheduled, um, because that just gives the trees time. It's not that the forest management activity will be bad. It's often beneficial to the trees because you're giving them enough growing space and enough light that they're really healthy and vigorous. But doing it in the year immediately following defoliation and, and disturbance from these pests can really impact them, kind of the compounding um, stressors. Um, moving on to a uh, conifer defoliator, we have spruce budworm, which feeds on balsam firs and spruces. Um, consecutive years of outbreaks, the trees are definitely going to be impacted and will often lead to dieback. Those conifers really don't withstand defoliation as well as, as hardwoods do. Um, we've had a bit of an outbreak. Um, last time was in 2000 to 2002. And um, throughout the state, the populations remain fairly low, although we are starting to see a small uptick in, in the traps. White pine weevil is one that a lot of people are kind of familiar with uh, vaguely because they see these big wolfy pines in their woods, but don't know what caused it or don't know that it was caused you know, when this large, large tree was um, just a sapling is when that was initiated, that form was initiated. So white pine weevil, they're native. They, they get into the top shoot of that terminal shoot of a white pine and they will girdle and kill that. And that, when a, when a conifer's terminal uh, shoot is damaged, the next whirl will start to take over and grow. Um, if you want a tree without this kind of bush cabbage effect, then you can prune out the dead whirl and select a new terminal and that one will take over and um, you know create that create that nice form tree with one terminal. But if you don't do that, then they will all kind of compete and continue to reach for the sunlight. Um, with this white pine weevil keeping shade on pine regeneration, so it's not out in the in the open sun, often keeps these um, insects at a lower population. You might get a little bit of damage, but not as much as if they're in an open field. So a lot of times what you're seeing when you see a whole stand of these is post agriculture, when this field was abandoned, it regenerated to pine. And then that pine was all in the open and it all got weevilled. Emerald ash borer is a really hot topic lately. I'm sure most of you have heard about it. 
Um, we have emerald ash borer in the state of Vermont and it has been spreading, it's an invasive. Um, this is a pretty small insect from Asia, um, makes a small D-shaped exit hole, small, small larva, create S-shaped galleries. Um, we start to notice one of the, the, a lot of ash trees are stressed and starting to decline, but one of the surefire ways to tell that it is emerald ash borer is to look for um, woodpecker blonding. So the woodpeckers know that the larvae are in that tree before we do, and they are going for them um, to try and eat them. And so you'll see this like blonde, blonde look of the, um, on the bark because the woodpeckers are flecking off that bark. Um, we want to really focus on slowing the spread of this in invasive insect in Vermont and so not moving firewood, um, really trying to quarantine anywhere. We have a map um, and I'll, I'll get to some resources later, but we have a map that we keep updating in the state and making sure that you know where you are on that map. And if you're in infested zone, you're not moving wood around. Um, and just being vigilant and looking for these signs and notifying somebody at the state if you if you see any of these sign, signs. Um, and then a note also that um, for control of this, we're not, you know, there, there is some individual tree um, pesticide that can be used to protect, you know, big stately trees, but mostly um, there's no control on a standwide level. What we can do is encourage ash regeneration so that in the future we can have have some some control. I guess I, I should change. There is no um, like spraying control. There is a biological control, um, several biological controls of wasps that um, will attack emerald ash borer, but they can't be released because they are so specific until there's a population. So there's no preemptive control. Once there's an emerald ash borer population, we can release um, some of these biocontrol wasps. They can reduce the population. And so if we have ash regeneration, then that you know, very young generation of ash trees may have more of a chance of having some balance in the ecosystem. But there's nothing we can do to really prevent it other than slowing the spread, making sure we're not moving firewood that's infested or trees that are infested. Um, and then we also at the state are recognizing that you, um, you know, it does make sense to harvest your ash before it is infested with emerald ash borer, but that needs to be part of a larger silvicultural system. Um, so we're, you know, if you're in the current use program, we're really trying to make sure that that's part of a, a thought through system. Um, and then there's also always the option to leave ash and try to, you know, hope for some uh, genetic resistance within the population. Another pest that has been around for a while and is, na you know, is native to the area um, is sugar maple borer. These larvae are laid um, you know, through the, through the bark and they will cut through the sapwood and leave what people often think of as like a smile or a grimace on a sugar maple tree. Um, these insects have a two year life cycle that they spend in the tree. And so by the time they are exiting, they're cutting quite a um, crevice through that sapwood of the tree and it will always uh, scar over and be a weak point for the tree. So increasing diversity in your forest so that you have, um, you know, not just sugar maples being attacked by sugar maple borer and encouraging sugar maple health and vigor is really important. So making sure that you're thinning your stand and keeping these trees growing as strong as possible is really important. Hemlock woolly adelgid is another invasive that we've been dealing with in the state. Its, um, its population remains pretty steady in southern Vermont. It's, um, you know, largely controlled by weather right now. Our cold winters are enough to, to 
kind of keep it in check and it's not spreading um, far out of those uh, out of those places where it's already located. Um, these insects, you can see these tiny white uh, flecks. They are piercing sucking insect that um, is is eating sucking the juices from the tree and will cause the tree to thin and often this results in death um, not immediately but it basically sucks the life out of the trees. Um, crop tree release of healthy hemlock and diversifying your forest are ways to you know not prevent hemlock woolly deldrid from being present in a stand but help the overall health of your forest and stand. Hemlock elongate scale is another invasive, which is unfortunately compounding the, the effects of hemlock woolly adeldrid and increasing mortality. This one can be recognized by yellowing of needles on the interior and lower branches at first, and then the populations will increase and that will kind of move throughout the tree. Um, and it will, it will also cause death um, of, the, of these trees. So some other health, tree health pests um, that I've had a lot of questions about these this year. Um, maple leaf anthracnose is um, this foliar disease that people often are noticing um, both maple leaf cutter and anthracnose on the same tree. And it's causing um, just these kind of like brown leaves that are um, you know, prematurely dropping off, not getting, you know, normal stunning fall colors. Um, doing things like increasing ventilation in your stand through thinning um, and really keeping the trees as healthy as possible will decrease levels of anthracnose. You know, it is a, um, it's a disease and so any disease is going to move around more and spread in our, you know, we had such a wet summer this year. And so that wet summer didn't do us any favors in terms of um, diseases and blights. But the, the good thing to know is, you know, even if your tree looks pretty bad this year, it's not going to, you know, severely impact the tree's health. Beach bark disease is another one that, you know, is really widespread throughout the state. And um, this is a, oh, I, I forgot to put um, an indicator in the title of this one, but this is a, a native insect that is piercing the tree. And then the, the issue is this invasive fungus that enters through the insect. Um, and so it'll, it will affect the tree um, and start to, to create these pock marks of beech trees are pretty stressed. They tend to sprout and die back. Um, they're, they're weakened by the presence of the fungus in the tree. Um, and we want to just, you know, be vigilant in promoting any healthy trees that we are finding. There is some resistance. Um, there's also more, we're noticing some tolerance from trees that they're infested, but they're not succumbing like, like their neighbors are. And so, um, you know, increasing species diversity and encouraging healthy trees wherever we find them. And then I also wanted to, you know, put a plug in to not forget about all these abiotic factors. So sometimes people, you know, I go out on a tree call and somebody thinks their tree, you know, must be infested with something invasive and, uh, it's oftentimes that there is a native pathogen moving in to a, um, you know, to an entry point because there's some dead wood due to like old weed whacker damage or um, the tree's health is already declining because the soil is severely um, compacted or there's maybe an old rope or, or something that was put around the tree for a hammock and then it's grown over and that's girdling the tree. Um, drought and also heavy rains and kind of this whole combination of climate change 
is creating a huge impact for our tree's health um, and all these you know, extremes that they're, they're experiencing is causing this overall decline and then they're much more likely to be um, impacted by a native, a native pest that is just kind of taking advantage of that almost like um, what we would consider like a low immune system in a human. It's like the tree's um, barriers are just sort of um, decrease or their, their natural um, barriers. Another thing that we also see a lot um, is kind of this untimely frost, like the leaves will start to come out in the spring and then they'll get frosted that will impact the tree for the rest of the year, although it's not, you know, not causing severe impact. Um, we also see scun, sun scald. So if trees are opened up too quickly, they, um, you know, trees that really appreciate having some neighbors and some shade, they can be opened up and released to increase their health and vigor, but doing it in kind of a series of steps rather than all at once can be, um, a easier way for them to tolerate that. Salt is also a huge impact. So if you have trees along a road, thinking about the level of salt they're getting each year, and maybe that's the cause of some foliar damage. Um, and, and we already, already talked about this heavy rain, but that can also, you know, kind of loosen the soil and then we get a, a wind event following that and that can cause trees to tip over and die. Um, and so I just want to bring up that. And then lastly, this, I just want thought this image was great to remind people that, um, you know, sometimes what you're, if you're looking at the crown of the tree and seeing some dieback or something, you may not be thinking about the, um, the trunk of the tree and that, that dieback in the crown is actually a response of that tree being, um, you know, essentially suffocated and not having the proper um, level of fill around the root collar that can that can really kill trees pretty quickly but it's hard to notice sometimes when you're looking up at the up at the crown and in the the sign of the the issue um, this can also be you know sometimes this is compaction also on here somebody fills in around a tree and then that is continually compacted so just a couple of reminders about tree health here are a few resources. Um, if anybody's familiar with QR codes, these, you point your camera at these codes and don't take a picture, but just hold the camera up as if you're going to take a picture. It will bring you to a link um, and open each one of these web pages. So each one of these is a different resource for forest health. Um, the last Two, so VT invases will tell you all about invases in Vermont. There are different links you can follow through that website to look at um, specifically at invasive plants or invasive pests. And this other one um, right next to it with the, the really long uh, list uh, or really long um, website, um, that will bring you to these 2021 insect and disease observations. And so each month the state puts out um, these observations and they can be really, um, really eye-opening to see what, what sort of patterns we're seeing across the state. And so if you're interested in this sort of thing, that's a great place to go for more information. And finally, questions. Awesome, thank you, Hannah for that presentation. That was really awesome. Um, I'm going to go into the chat and we'll see what our first question was. Um, so it looks like the first question was that someone was hoping that bronze birch borer was going to be addressed. You think you could touch on bronze birch borer for a little bit? Sure. So bronze birch borer um, is a, a relative actually of emerald ash borer. Um, they have a very similar body shape. Um, I can try to go back, go back. There we go. So bronze birch borer is a little bit larger 
than emerald ash borer. Um, and it is more of a kind of bronzy brown color, but they look very, very similar. They will also create these, these shaped exit holes and um, they're a native. And so they certainly can, can impact trees. A lot of times you'll see a lot of sapsucker and wood, you know, other woodpeckers feeding on those trees and um, that can be alarming. So it shows up a lot on um, birch trees when you get that woodpecker damage. If it's a yard tree, um, you know, something that you are trying to keep alive in your yard, you planted it, there are some control measures. Um, those are much more in the realm of like hiring an arborist to tell you how to do those controls. Uh, in a forest, we don't see it at a large scale. Um, it's much more common in, in kind of shade trees and yard trees. Um, and so I, de I definitely focus more on the forest wide scale um, and look at things that are impacting, you know, multiple trees really impacting a, a stand of trees. When it comes to kind of keeping yard trees healthy, I definitely point people in the direction of arborists. I don't know if that's, um, does that answer that? sort of question. Yeah, I think that was a good overview. Um, thank you, Hannah. Um, so the next question is, can you address the use of mectinite for ash borers? Um, I cannot. I'm not super familiar. Again, I would, if it's a, if it's a specific, um, you know, pesticide, herbicide use, I would point people in the direction of talking to it to a licensed uh, pesticide applicator who's doing that, you know, arborist. Um, as far as, you know, ash trees being treated, um, kind of, again, at the, that forest level, we're not seeing it. It's being done some in New Hampshire on an experimental level, but not in a large forest-wide setting. And so anything um, kind of in your yard, tree you want to protect, I would, I would work with an arborist. Thank you. Um, so the next question. So I was told that there's a way to inoculate ash trees individually. Can you speak to that? How would you go forward with planning slash administering? Yeah, so there is, and I can, um, you said there would be some resources you could provide later on, is that? Yeah. So um, within Forest Parks and Recreation Department, we have the Urban and Community Forestry Department um, or div division. They have done a lot of work to create a list of licensed arborists that are administering um, ash, ash insecticides. But again, I don't, I am not an expert on that. So I don't wanna try to pretend to be. So I can, I can get some information to people or they can just look up the urban and community forestry um, department in within forest parks and recreation. Great. And the, the parks uh, consulted with some organizations about that too. So I can throw in some resources that I'm familiar with as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Teamwork. Um, so the next question, what can be done about extreme soil compaction over decades in a natural forest area due to heavy recreational use? That's a good one. Um, I guess the, what I would start with is trying to limit that recreation use to a single path and designating that sort of path as your, you know, you're going to have compaction on that path. Um, when we have these sort of multi-use forests, um, it can be really hard to integrate all of the uses and they can all have some, you know, negative effects when they're, when they become kind of that primary use. So if, if past recreation was, you know, really heavy, 
um, designating certain places where you know that that's going to be an issue. And then starting to just build that soil, um, you know, adding in lots of coarse woody debris, dropping, um, you know, dropping trees in a way that protects that area, makes it hard for people to get in there again, or bikes or whatever it might be. Um, there is some work being done kind of experimentally, but like pulling trees over with excavators and bulldozers, um, that can certainly loosen soil by starting to create this, you know, tip up mound. Um, but just focusing not so much on um, like getting in there and killing it or anything like that. I wouldn't suggest that. I, I think that'd be more disturbing than just trying to work with what you have and, you know, letting nature um, work its magic. Every, every winter we get these freeze and thaw cycles that start to loosen our soil and, and move earth around, even if it's at a really small level, just letting, letting winter do that. Um, and then adding carbon wherever we can through treetops and, and large trees. Great, thank you, Hannah. Good answer. Um, so, let's see, um, I'll just mention now that um, I will be sending an email out um, with a link to the recording. And Hannah, if it's okay to send the slides as well. Yeah, sure. Okay, yep, so I'll add the slides, um, Hannah's contact information, and then we'll compile some resources to send out in that email too. So um, we'll try to cover all these questions that we can through uh, an email with a bunch of resources. So the next question, we've had a problem with filbert worms on our hybrid hazelnut trees. Can you recommend any insect predators we can buy or and release or biological controls like BT? we harvest the nuts to eat? I can't say I'm super familiar. Um, I, can, I can get you some information. If you wanna send an email, I can work with our other forest health specialists. Um, so I'm a county forester. I do a lot of like kind of general um, work on lots of private land. And we have force health specialists within the state of Vermont that really know a lot more than I do on individual pests and control measures. So I'm happy to connect you with them. Great. Yeah, so um, Jane, we will include that in the email with some more specific resources to direct you guys to. Um, hopefully that helps. Um, the next question, any info on Asian jumping worms? Yeah, um, info I have is that they have not been found in the state yet. Um, we're on the lookout. They are in neighboring states and um, uh, maybe again, a, another resource to connect people with. There's pretty good information from Michigan. Um, they've done a lot of research and outreach on control measures, um, really trying to you know, be diligent about if you get a if you get a plant from a nursery or something, checking to see if there's worms in there. If there are, um, killing them, getting rid of them. Don't just dump them in your woods. Even dumping them in your compost is a little bit um, tricky. Like these jumping worms change the soil in a way that isn't beneficial to garden plants, um, and so we're you know trying to eliminate them and trying if you don't know one worm versus another just eliminating all of them that might come from any nursery stock so the next question i like this one what is the best response to folks who suggest wood chips and more wood chips in lieu of coarse woody debris or woody material i should say yeah um this is a yeah, an interesting uh, approach. So what I suggest, or what I would say is that um, when we try to mimic nature as best as possible, wood chips are not part of the natural system. 
Um, they might be around a beaver pond or something where a beaver has some a few wood chips, but they're not part of like a any sort of natural disturbance that we might be mimicking. So in a natural disturbance, like a small microburst or, or just single tree event, you're going to get branches and um, you know up to an entire tree and leaving those things in their parts um, is the best way that nature knows how to use them. And it knows, you know, nature knows how to use those uh, over the course of a hundred years. You might have a sugar maple that decomposes from a, you know, that huge trunk, the leaves are gonna decompose right away and then work all the way down to that, that big um, trunk that's gonna be decomposing in some way for a very long time. Um, so wood chips, you know, everything is really uniform size. They work really well in a garden, but it's not a natural process to, you know, kind of put that huge input into the forest and um, all of, I guess I can say, all of those pieces are going to decompose at close to the same rate. So you're not going to get this sort of like natural prolonged decomposition of that material. It's going to be all at once um, and then nothing. I hope that kind of answers the question. If, if there's a follow up, I'm happy to talk through that. So there was a comment, Hannah, that Asian jumping worms are absolutely in Vermont. Maybe you can address that. Uh, I can certainly do my research and, and find out. I was under the impression that they were not yet. So um, I'd be interested in knowing if, if they have been reported and if they've been, um, you know, confirmed and just, you know, sort of you know, following up with that a little bit more. I'm certainly, I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And that's, uh, that's fine. I'm always happy to get more information. It's also possible to, um, there's other types of jumping worms that are in the state. So it's possible to be um, mixing those up. They look very similar, but yeah. Um, to the next question, what causes multiple burls on conifers? Do I need to worry about this? Just moved to the property and haven't seen this level of burls and spruce slash firs before. Um, so burls can be, you know, can be an issue if you're looking to create or looking to grow, you know, nice straight timber trees, but they're not um, really a, a huge health concern. Um, if they are, I guess there's a, there's a difference between burls and galls. So galls are kind of smaller um, on the branches more. Um, and those are often, you know, caused by different insects. So there's a spruce gall worm that can cause small galls um, on kind of the tips of the branches that, and then those branches will, you know, um, show signs of those galls being there. You know, large kind of burls on the trunk. Um, I am not entirely sure that what would cause those, but can again look into it. So the next question is: Are there spotted lantern fly? Are the spotted lantern flies thriving in Vermont? That's a great question. No, they are not. They were. Um, they were in. Accepted. So they have been, they're not um, present in Vermont at all. They found some um, on some packing that came into, it was in the Rutland area and it was intercepted and um, they believe that it's been controlled. So we are still vigilantly looking for any, um, any that people think they might find or see, but the one um, the one find wasn't even, isn't even considered an outbreak because it didn't get out, you know, into, um, you know, in, into the unknown environment, it was intercepted. Great. Um, and then, there, so there is another comment 
Um, UVM has lots of research and info on jumping worms in Vermont. Um, yeah, so I, I would just encourage to look up those resources and research and information out there um, to learn more about the jumping worms. Um, and we can include that in the email as well. Um, great. So I, that looks like that's all the questions. Um, if I missed any and anyone wants to point that out, um, please do so now. Or if you have any lingering questions that you want to add, um, now would be the time to do so. Okay, so uh, any other nut tree diseases of note, like butternut blight? Yeah, butternut blight um, is present. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Was it a question or? Yeah, um, it was a question, yeah. Any other nut tree diseases of note, like butternut blight? Uh, um, yeah, so butternut blight is... Um, certainly alive and well in Vermont. It impacts a lot of um, butternuts. You will see um, kind of die back in the crowns. Oftentimes the butt of the tree will have, um, or somewhere on the bowl of the tree will have kind of this oozy black um, substance from the butternut light. It is not, um, you know, there really isn't much of a control for it. We are trying to promote healthy butternut, trying to, um, there is a, you know, some effort to collect healthy butternut uh, nuts and propagate them, but it's, um, you know, largely just alive on the, um, alive in the state. Oh, sorry. There's... <laughs> It's a fly on my camera. <laughs> uh, so so it's, it's, a, it's around, um, there is chestnut blight in the state, not a whole lot of native chestnuts making it. It's um, to any chestnuts that are, you know, naturally uh, propagating. Generally, they're, they're getting to about pole size and then they're succumbing to chestnut blight. There's, um, and those are the only, you know, only two really well-known ones. Um, there may be other ones that are lesser known to me. And hopefully no new ones coming our way. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, it seems like it's becoming a theme, unfortunately. It does. Um, not to end on a sad note or anything. <laughs> Um, okay, so I don't, I'm not seeing any more questions. I did see Karen sent a link in um, about invasive worms in Vermont. So uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at that. There's definitely lots of different types of invasive worms um, that we can encounter and some new ones as well. Um, yeah, so thank you all for attending. Um, Hannah, thank you so much for doing this. Um, this is the last um, working Woodlands Workshop for fall season. Um, we will be um, sending out some information about the upcoming programs um, starting in January. So keep an eye out for that. When you registered, you there was an option for um, being put on the newsletter. So if you selected yes on that, you'll be receiving the newsletter that'll come out um, likely next month. Um, and the email with the link to the recording resources um, to direct you guys to. That'll come out. I'll send it later this week. I'm out of office the rest of today and tomorrow. So I'm um, hoping to get that out by Friday. Um, yeah, thank you all again. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, you know, I will certainly take any questions and direct you to information. Um, I'll, I'll be the, the through person if I wasn't able to answer your question. You did a great job. Thank you, Hannah. I'm just going to stay on a little bit longer and then I'll end the Zoom. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thanks.